All right. I think all of you are aware of the fact that in science, we're very careful about the use of the word causality. Most of you have already been in sessions where you've been taught that it's better to think in terms of covariation or association. So to talk about whether HIV AIDS caused what we're seeing right now with HIV in black communities in the United States is to make a claim that's uh, rather extreme. Let's see what's at the base of it. These are images that don't often make their way into mainstream media, but they're telling examples of one of the challenges that the country is facing at present. This is perhaps the most telling slide of all. What we're looking at is a change in the way in which we deal with a variety of social phenomena in the United States. We are 5% of the world's population, but we incarcerate 25% of all the prisoners doing time in prisons anywhere in the world. 5% of the world's population, we house 25% of all the world's prisoners right here. What accounts for that? Well, many of you who've read on the topic are well aware of the fact that our war on drugs, more than anything else, began a phenomenon of mass incarceration that is neatly summarized there. Right now, it's estimated that there are some 2.2 million men doing time in state and federal prisons in the United States. And drug use and drug-related arrests account for almost all of this. Roughly three quarters of the increase in the federal prison population is a result of drug-related convictions, and roughly one half of the increase that you see here that occurred within state facilities is associated with drug-related convictions. It's sort of frightening to understand that at present, it is estimated that there are some 500,000 people doing time in state and federal prison facilities who are there literally because of arrests that were associated with drug use in form, some form or other. Now, the war on drugs has an interesting history, as many of you know. Richard Nixon, in 1970, decided that uh, the round of drug abuse that was present throughout America during the midst of the 60s, when it was tune in, turn on, drop out, he felt that, more than anything else, drugs represented public enemy number one. And with the establishment of the Drug Enforcement Agency in 1973, we decided to take a problem that we in medicine and public health knew how to manage, knew how to control, and decided to make it the province of the courts and the police. We can't cure drug addiction, but we do know how to help people who are living with addictive disorders to manage their lives, to enter a period of what looks like more or less stable recovery, and find their places back in their families and their communities. We know how to do this but instead are moralizing about drug use in the 1970s and are worried that drug abuse was particularly at the core of crimes that were being committed in poor communities of color led us to decide that throwing folks into the pokey was the real solution to the problem. Think about drug-related arrests. It's estimated that uh, since 1972, Drug-related arrests have increased by a factor of almost three. Michelle Alexander, in her very fine book, The New Jim Crow, estimates that there have been some 31 million arrests since the 1970s that have all been associated with drug busts. So what has that got to do with HIV AIDS? Well, since I'm talking to an audience of folk who know medicine and who are engaged in public health, the answer, of course, is everything. We made a decision as a nation that we would lock up the group that was at greatest risk for exposure to HIV. And locking them up meant that, in the 1970s, we were engaging in a set of public policies that were occurring just about at the time that HIV was taking hold within the general population. As all of you know, while 1981 is routinely considered to be the origin of the HIV epidemic, what it really marks instead is the origin of our awareness that this epidemic was present in our midst. People who showed up in clinics with uh, cancers that were associated with old age and with obvious problems with their 
immune systems that resulted in a wide variety of rather exotic pneumonias were really obviously in the end stages of HIV disease. So since HIV is largely asymptomatic and takes 10 to 15 years before the first real AIDS-related illnesses appear, it's reasonable to suppose that in a lot of drug-using networks in the 1970s, you already had HIV spreading rapidly. And then all of a sudden, it spreads to the prisons. Now, although current thinking is that folk who are living with HIV in prison probably were infected in the community, there's every reason to believe that at the very beginning of the epidemic, with high rates of drug use in many prison facilities, and with large numbers of inmates reporting that they were sexually active, because this was activity that was unprotected, and because the drug use was probably one in which people shared works, the likelihood that some of the origins of HIV, especially in the black community, started with what was happening in the prisons in the 1970s. And because mass incarceration is such a hugely racialized issue in the United States, with 38% of all the inmates doing time in state or federal prisons being African Americans, we shouldn't be surprised that with black Americans comprising in many instances one half of all new HIV epidemics, that somehow these two phenomena are correlated. One can imagine what it must have been like in settings like this, overcrowded, largely black and brown, where a variety of different networks were formed that persisted in prison life and it probably continued when men returned to the community. Now, it's at this point that it becomes extremely important to note that this is not a presentation that is designed to stigmatize a population that is already living with the stigma of having a history of incarceration. It is not a moment to blame the men for being, if you will, typhoid Marys. What I'm trying to describe is a set of public policies that were, for all intents and purposes, irrational. They had consequences that we are still doing our best to control. If you know the history of uh, our attempts to record trends in HIV, what you're looking at here is probably all too familiar. At the outset, we were looking at a phenomenon that was largely located in gay communities. But it quickly became something that was dominant in poor communities of color, particularly amongst African Americans. With 50% of all new cases in many instances, in many communities, being amongst black men and women, the whole question of whether or not their circulation between the prison and the community isn't a factor that not only spiked the epidemic, but continues to maintain it. It's important to understand that uh, while we have incarcerated a large number of individuals, and that 2.2 million figure is really hard to grasp. The real issue, I think, perhaps, is what happens when people get out. Many of you who know the statistics are well aware of the fact that recidivism rates in the United States approach 70%. It means that you've got a seven, to seven chances out of 10 to go back to prison within three years after your release. So the cyclic pattern between the community on the one hand, the prisons on the other, obviously is a force to be reckoned with in maintaining the course of the epidemic. But I think it's also clear that we're talking about more than simple exposure to the virus. It's not just that this was a vector through which the epidemic found its way into the black community. I think it's also clear that the destruction of the communities in which these men resided also plays a key role in our difficult challenges in trying to get effective community-based HIV prevention and treatment programs up and running and maintained. And this has everything to do with what it must mean in many communities to have so many men lost to community life. In some communities like the one we're in here in 1990, on any given day of the week, it was probably the case that somewhere between 35 and 40% of all the young men between the ages of 19 and 34 were either in prison, on parole, or under the supervision of the courts. In family-oriented poor communities, the loss of so many men has to be a factor in destabilizing a lot of the efforts that we know keep people healthy. Men who are returning from prison 
you must recall, are men who have lost many of the rights of citizenship. They can't vote. They're unable to participate in the life of the community, the political life that has so much to do with how money is spent and how decisions governing daily life are undertaken. It's also the case that they are at risk for homelessness. It's also the case that in addition to having to worry about finding a job in an economy that is becoming ever more difficult, the fact that their status as former felons means that in many instances they cannot qualify for educational loans. So with a population that is likely to be 61% illiterate or poorly educated, their ability to maintain themselves in their communities, their ability to maintain themselves within their families becomes severely challenged. And if you understand the degree to which folk who live in public housing face particular challenges, the idea, for example, that if you have been convicted of a drug-related offense, not only do you not qualify for federal housing, either in the projects or in Section 8 housing, if you house someone who was a felon, the likelihood is that the entire family will be kicked out. So think about the, think about the challenge that mothers faced in welcoming the man back into the house. Was it more important to have him there with the kids, or is it more important that they reduce the likelihood that they too would become homeless? I want to suggest that mass incarceration has in many instances destroyed the, the, the sanctity and the ability of the black family to resist the kinds of challenges that are presented by an, an, an epidemic like HIV AIDS. And I want to suggest that with so few males being involved in the lives of kids in the community in general, that the vacuum that was created with their absence has meant that many of the risk behaviors that expose people to HIV are no longer going to be presided over by adults who are keeping a careful watch on the young. And with a third of the epidemic being concentrated in folk under the age of 25, the simple fact that men are no longer able to supervise many aspects of community life means that in many respects, mass incarceration did more to destroy family life in the community, did more to destroy the community's capacity to develop the kind of collective efficacy that we depend on when we build public health interventions, that it should be no surprise whatsoever that their loss to the community ultimately paved the way for the creation of a niche for HIV in the community that we are still struggling to deal with. Did uh, mass incarceration cause this epidemic? The language may be strong, but I think it's quite clear that what it has done is create a situation that we are struggling to deal with. Are there answers? I believe that there are. Every Monday at 5.30 in the morning, I get up and drive two hours to Woodbourne State Correctional Facility, where I teach a bunch of inmates who are involved in the Bard College Prison Initiative about the principles of public health. Because it's a medium security facility, a significant number of these men will get out and will be college graduates. Their ability to enter the workforce, their ability to join us in some of our efforts to organize the community against many health disparities, I think is going to be significantly advanced. They themselves see that they have a commitment to creating a new life in the community. And if they are given half a chance, I think they will succeed. I want to believe that because recidivism rates for those who get a college degree in the inside are very much lower than those for every other member of the general population in prison, that this represents a reasonably cost-effective answer to a set of challenges placed in motion at the beginning of the 1970s when this infernal war on drugs was undertaken. That means that all of us perhaps have a role to play. If education has been such an important part of your own careers and your outlooks for the future, isn't it reasonable to suppose that simply doing what we used to do in the prisons before 1972 was possible? We used to rehabilitate prisoners. Now we're about punishing them. Well, rehabilitation for many begins with education. And I think we're the ones to undertake that challenge. As old black preachers once said, uh, if not us, who? And if not now, when? Thank you.